clouds by night. Oh, throughout the heavens, there shone a holy light. So go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds fear and tremble. chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. So go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born.
Well, Merry Christmas Eve, everybody. Can you believe it? It is here. It is Christmas Eve. And I'm not sure where you are or what traditions you have this year. And I'm sure for many of you, it looks very different than it normally does uh, and has in years past. I'm grateful that you've taken time out of your crazy schedule of celebrating to really turn your hearts to the real reason of what Christmas is about. We're grateful that we have this opportunity to, to worship together. A huge thank you to Sean and Mary and the entire Malone family for the amazing job that you did of getting us in the Christmas spirit with that worship set. And a, a huge thank you to you, Sean, for all that you do to make sure that these videos are up and look so good uh, every week. If you, are, if you have Sean and Mary's phone number or if you're watching live and, and you've got the comment section, I want you to take a second and thank them for the work that they're doing. We couldn't do it without you. We love you. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Well, I, as I kind of referenced earlier, this Christmas looks a little different for a lot of us, doesn't it? But the thing that hasn't changed in the midst of the turmoil and craziness of our world and, and the year 2020, the thing that hasn't changed is the reason why we celebrate Christmas. It's not the traditions or the presents or the food or even the family celebrations that might look a little different this year. It's about Jesus. It's about who Christ was and what you do with him. That's what Christmas is focused on. That's what Christmas is about. And my prayer is that over the next few moments that we spend our time together uh, this evening, that you center your heart towards that. You refocus towards that. That you and your families would take a, uh, this time to, to kind of center yourselves around the heartbeat of who Christ is. And I pray that as we do that, uh, that this Christmas becomes one of the most joy-filled and most meaningful Christmases we've ever had. Would you pray with me as we kick our time off today that God would do just that in our hearts and our lives tonight. Father, thank you for all that you are and all that you do. Thank you that a long time ago, uh, in your love for us, while we were stuck in sin, you sent your Son to this world to walk in our shoes, to empathize with our struggles as humans, and to eventually work his way to the cross so that we could have hope of eternal life and a right relationship with you. At the crux, at the heartbeat of what Christmas is about, it's all about Jesus. And we are so grateful that we have been invited to the table. We have been a part of this Christmas story as you invite us in and I pray that something that is said or done tonight uh, would resonate with us, that would allow us to embrace the heart of Christmas in a way that maybe we never have. And I pray that you get me out of the way over the next few minutes and you would speak through me in these moments as we prepare our hearts to celebrate this Christmas season. Be glorified in everything that is said and done. Lord, we love you. Thanks for loving us. Amen. Well, for years, actually all the way back while I was a kid, my parents decided to come up with this tradition that we would do as a family that I'm really grateful for looking back. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. On Christmas morning, um, mom and dad always said, listen, we're going to sit down and we're going to read Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story together, and we're going to pray together as a family before we do anything else. Now, as a kid, that was incredibly frustrating because as you can imagine, you wake up on Christmas morning and you run out to the, to the living room and what you want to do is just tear into the presents. But... As I started to get older, that actually became one of my favorite things that we did. And now that I look back, it is by far one of the most meaningful things of my childhood. It's, it's a tradition that we are carrying on in our home uh, with our daughter Ellie, and we hope that she grows to cherish that as well. But it, it's, it's just a great way to kind of remind us as a family that it's not about the presents, it's not about all the, the celebrations or the, the decorations, it's about Jesus. And I love reading Luke chapter 2. We'll do that again in the morning. And uh, that's how we'll kick off our morning and, and our day together. But we always usually stop at that the end of this part where it says, And Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And rightfully so. It's kind of like a nice little bow at the end of the, the heartbeat of the story that Luke, Dr. Luke, tells us. But the verses that follow in Luke chapter 2 actually tell us what happens next. They tell us the rest of the story that happens eight days later and then a, a few weeks later. Uh, but those were huge. Those were really important in the life 
of a Jewish family. You see, in those days, the Jews of the first century followed a very strict set of customs whenever a baby was born. Here was the, the timeline for that, right? At the eighth day was really important, especially for male children. Like when the baby boys were born, on the eighth day is when they would be uh, taken to be circumcised and then officially dedicated and given their name. That was when they were embraced as the name that that the family had chosen. In this case, the angel had told Joseph and Mary months before that when you do this, you're going to name this child Jesus. He will save the world from their sins. This is the Messiah. And so here on the days that follow in Luke chapter 2, we see them following that custom of getting Jesus circumcised and naming him the name that God gave him. Another huge tradition or a huge part of the Jewish culture was what was known as the redemption of the firstborn child. You see, in those days, if your child, if you weren't a part of the Levite tribe, um, there had to be this ceremony, according to Leviticus uh, and Exodus, God gave this ceremony where they would say to them, listen, if you are going to have a firstborn son and they are not going to work as a Levite in the temple, you need to pay to redeem or buy them back as a recognition that they belong to God uh, and and you are going to take care of them. It's a, a very powerful and incredibly um, intricate dedication and consecration of that child to the Lord. It was something that involved going to the sanctuary and paying a fee of shekels. Uh, and it was a it was one of these powerful moments that every Jewish family, when they had a firstborn child, especially a firstborn son, would follow that tradition. According to Leviticus chapter 12, there was a third tradition that had to take place, and that was a, a time of purification for the mother. In, in, in the case of a, a mom who gave birth to a son, they had to wait 40 days until they could be declared clean again, ceremonial, ceremonially clean. And in a, if they gave birth to a, a female, it was 80 days, right? They, that meant they had to be isolated from the community um, and take care of their children, but not allowed to participate in the Jewish uh, traditions and then going to the temple and all of those things. But when the time of their purification was over, they would then travel to the temple and they would offer two different sacrifices, a burnt sacrifice, which was usually a lamb, and then a sin sacrifice, which was either a pigeon or a turtle dove. Now, in the case of a family that was poor, you could actually substitute the lamb for uh, another turtle dove. So you bring two turtle doves, hence the song, bring two turtle doves, uh, as part of the sacrifice um, to, to do the purification ritual. And then the priest would declare that you were clean and as a mother you could get back into Jewish society. Those were huge customs of the Jewish world. Now you say, Aaron, why is that so important? Well, here's why. The events that we're going to read together tonight at the end of Luke chapter 2 take place as Joseph and Mary are following those three Customs. So if you have your Bibles, or if you're following along on the Version Bible app, and bear with me because this is a new thing for me, my glasses, uh, Luke chapter 2, uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 21. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. It says this, On the eighth day, remember the significance of that, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, 40 days for them, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two pigeons. <clears throat> now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all People, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause 
the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and the sword will pierce your own soul too. This is a, this is a part of the Christmas story that I'm not sure we ever fully talk about or read along Christmas, because we normally stop at Mary pondering all of the events of Christmas Day in her heart. And yet, there's so much significance, so much to unpack in these verses, and we hope to do it over the next few minutes together. If you're taking notes, the first thing that I want you to write down as we get our hearts wrapped around this passage is this. At the manger, the incarnate God became I am for all people. At the, at the manger, the incarnate God, it just means in flesh, God in flesh, became the I am for all people. Listen, the birth of Jesus to a, a carpenter and his betrothed bride, attended by lowly shepherds in a town that used to have huge significance, but now had been kind of irrelevant for centuries, shows that this message was for all people. But it doesn't stop there. Do you catch what this this man in the temple says to them. Now, you have to get your head wrapped around this, right? Like, Simeon is just there doing what he always does. He's celebrating who God is. He's worshiping God. He is offering sacrifices. He is a devout man and who has been waiting, like every Jewish person, person for centuries for the Messiah to show up. <clears throat> He's been waiting for this Messiah. Now, he has he hasn't been alive for centuries, but the Jewish people have been waiting for centuries. And he was among them. And when Joseph and Mary come to their, the temple to do all of the things that are customary for a family to do after giving birth, the moment that Simeon lays eyes on Jesus, he knows. The Holy Spirit does something in him, and he knows this is the Messiah. And he goes over to Joseph and Mary. Can you imagine being Joseph and Mary and have this guy that you don't know prophesy that this is the light for all the Gentiles, the hope for the world, the Messiah. Now, if it were us, we'd probably think some crazy man is talking to us and our child and mom would probably grab tight and run away. But, but Joseph and Mary, they knew who their son was. And they, they weren't strangers to weird greetings, were they? Whether it was Gabriel, the angel showing up to announce the birth of Christ, or even Mary's cousin Elizabeth prophesying who Jesus was going to be. Like, they were used to this strange phenomenon because they didn't give birth to just an ordinary child, did they? And did you catch what Simeon says? I love how he puts it here, right? Simeon says, listen, this is the light for all the Gentiles and the hope for all of Israel. This Savior is for all people. This is big because there are a lot of Jews who didn't think that was the case. Most of the Jewish people, or many of the Jewish people, felt like when the Messiah showed up, it would just be for them. That they were God's chosen people. And because of that, when the Messiah came, it would be to reinstitute Israel. And they weren't worried about the Greeks or the, the Gentiles. They, they weren't worried about anybody else but themselves. But in this case, Simeon prophesies to Mary and Joseph what the angel had already said. This gift that God is giving the entire world is for everybody. It's for everybody. It's for me. It's for you. It's for your neighbor down the street. It's for, for more than Americans. It's for the, those living in China and those living in Haiti and those living in Russia and those living in the Ukraine and those living in the Middle East. and those like This message is for everyone. It's for people in the past that have already long since gone. It's for, for your kids and your grandkids. It's for our future. Jesus came not just for one group of people and one period of time. When he came, he came to be the I am for all. The I am for all. When he said, I am the light of the world, I'm the bread of life, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the door, the gate, I'm the resurrection and the life, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus made those statements, he was making those statements for you and for me, for everybody he became the I am for the entire world. In Isaiah chapter 42, we find out that when God called the people of Israel to be his chosen people, it was also about sharing the hope of who God was with the rest of the world. But, but the Jewish people and the descendants of Abraham, 
took that to mean that they were special and so it was only their message. And for centuries, rather than being a light to the world, they kept it to themselves. And even that didn't work well because they were so disobedient over and over and over. Listen to Isaiah chapter 42. The Lord says, I have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind. It got me thinking this week, perhaps the chosen people title wasn't a statement of partiality, but one of responsibility. Maybe when God looked at the people of Israel and made a covenant with Abraham and said, you will be my people, I will be your God and you'll be my people, what he was saying to them is not, you are better than everybody else, but I have chosen you to bear the responsibility to share the light of my word and my truth to the rest of the world. And because Israel had failed to do that, God sent Jesus to take care of it. So the birth of Jesus at the manger becomes the ultimate invitation for the rest of the world. The incarnation, the in flesh of God in the form of Jesus at the manger, became my resurrection and life. My hope. And I want you to, I want you to really chew on that this Christmas season. Do you really believe that this story is more than just a story written in Luke 2 that it gives us the opportunity to have a fun celebration throughout the year? Or do you believe that what Jesus did and what God did by sending Jesus to the manger was revealing himself to the entire world so that we have a chance to be saved? As, as the writer John said in John 3.16, so that whosoever believes, which means... It's for you. And it's not only for you, it's for the people that you love. And not just the people that you love, it's for the people that you don't even like that much. I think it's time we as Christians really get back to the heart of the manger. And that is, God says, I am here for you and for everyone. As we can only find contentment and true peace when we meet Christ and acknowledge and accept him for who he is and why he came. And that is true for all of us. It's true for all of us. And if you're taking notes, I want you to remember that. That there are those of us who are going through life searching for meaning and purpose and peace and hope. And we're looking for it in all kinds of places. But the only real peace, the only real hope, the only real joy that we have is what Jesus did for all people when he was born in a manger, to become the Savior of the world. This term, consolation of Israel, that Luke uses to describe what Simeon was experiencing is, is all about Messianic prophecies. It's, it's looking back to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and Malachi and all these prophets from centuries before who had been promising the hope of the Savior and the Messiah. And now the people of Israel, who are largely in turmoil because of their own mistakes and stupidity and their own brokenness and sin, are crying out to God, when are you going to send a Savior? When are you going to send our help? When are you going to send a rescue? And, and then in Bethlehem, Jesus shows up and says, here I am. And the customs following the birth of Christ, as they take, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple, this guy Simeon takes one look at Jesus and basically, he says this, doesn't he? He says, I can die a happy man. Right? He says, I, you can dismiss your servant in peace. I have seen the Savior, the consolation of Israel, the hope, the help, the rescue that we have been praying for. I have laid eyes on him, and that changes everything for me. Can you imagine the joy that he felt, this old guy, Simeon, who had been, like so many others for centuries before him, had been waiting for the help that God had promised, takes one look at Jesus and says, oh my goodness, that's, that's my Messiah, that's my Savior. And this rush of peace rushes over him. So I really want you to get this. In the midst of all the turmoil that you may find yourself in right now, the only real hope and peace and joy that you will ever find rests in the baby that was born in the manger to be your Savior. The consolation of Israel is our help 
and rescue as well. And that is what this Christmas season points us to, right? That's what the song, A Little Town of Bethlehem, talks about, right? He says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. But that invitation for you and I to experience the the help of God comes with the responsibility to somehow answer the invitation, right? We have an RSVP that we need to send back. What we do with this Christmas season, what we do with the consolation of Israel is ultimately what determines our peace. And Simeon takes one look at Jesus and says, God, I'm ready to go because now I have experienced who Jesus is in my life and that changes everything. And this is maybe the most important thing that you need to hear this Christmas season. Only when you and I see and experience Jesus, embrace who he really is, only when that happens can we ever have peace and contentment knowing that we are right with God and can go to see him someday. It's it's understanding why Jesus came and who Jesus was and what that means for us that gives us the assurance, the blessed assurance, the peace that passes all earthly understanding. It's what enables us to be ready to go to meet God someday. Simeon saw it, and it gave him a peace when he recognized the consolation of Israel. And my prayer is for many of you who are listening and watching, that if you haven't experienced that kind of peace, that you find it in Jesus tonight. Because what we do with the cross defines what we really think of the manger. What we do with the cross defines what we really think of the manger. Can you imagine the craziness of this moment where this man Simeon just randomly shows up and walks up to you and says, I want to tell you something. Like if, if we were today, we'd like hold our children and run away. But this wasn't weird for Mary and Joseph. I mean, in comparison to everything that's happened over the last nine months, this was pretty normal. An angel had showed up to prophesy. Mary's cousin Elizabeth had prophesied. So what's one more strange dude in the temple, right? What's, what's Simeon, Simeon say to them, though? He reiterates to them what they already know. Jesus has come to do something special. And what he was going to do would be incredibly divisive. There would be people who love him. And there would be people who hate him. Because he would reveal the hearts of mankind and that would divide. He even says to Mary, a sword's going to pierce your own soul. In other words, your heart will be broken because you're watching this happen. Guys, at the end of the day, what you and I do with what Christ did at Golgotha on the cross determines how we celebrate Bethlehem in the manger. At the end of the day, what will you do with who Jesus is? It matters. There are some who had been waiting anxiously for the Messiah to show up like Simeon. And the moment they saw Jesus, they knew. I mean, you could see that in his life, in his ministry. People were drawn to him. But there were others who were skeptical, who hated him, who didn't want him to be the Messiah. They were frustrated. And the life of Jesus was incredibly divisive when it came to revealing the hearts of mankind. This Christmas What are you going to do, not only with the birth of Jesus, but more importantly, what are you going to do with the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus? Ultimately, what you do with Christ on the cross matters. And if you're watching tonight, if you're listening tonight, and you've not yet experienced or embraced or accepted who Christ is, you will never truly be able to celebrate the meaning of Christmas the way that you're supposed to. That's my prayer for us. What you do with Christ at the cross has eternal significance. Do you believe that God sent his son into this world so that you and I could experience, as John said, eternal life? That whosoever believes could have eternal life. Do you believe that Jesus was who he said he was? That he came to do what he claimed he would do? And that ultimately what he did on the cross is what gives you and I the chance at eternal life with with God the Father? Simeon did. Simeon knew it. And he looked at God in this prayer that he prays and says, I can die a happy man. And it's not until you and I 
really embrace what Christ did on the cross that we'll ever have that kind of peace that says, you know what? I'm ready to meet God the Father. I mean, are you? Have you embraced that? Because what we do with the cross defines our ability to embrace what Jesus did at the manger. And what I want for you this Christmas more than anything else is to make sure that you have experienced that. So if you're listening tonight, if you're watching and and you've not experienced that, what a better time than Christmas Eve. What a better time to look at God and say, you know what? I've fallen short. I believe you are who you say you are. And I want you to come into my life and be Lord of my life. This is, this is your night. Can you imagine the celebration that you can have with your families? The contentment, the peace, the joy that you find in Christ because of that? Why not now? See, if you're a tweet or post anything this week, I want it to be this. We must first experience Christ at the cross before we can ever truly celebrate him at the manger. And I want to invite you to experience him at the cross so that you can celebrate properly this Christmas. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you are a God who not only came in a manger, but you came specifically to be our Savior, die on a cross, to take our place. And our peace and our hope and our contentment and our joy is rooted in that, that you came to die for us. And so, Lord, if there are those who are listening and watching that have not yet accepted you, I pray that right now they would experience you in your fullness, that they would They would just simply say to you, I believe you are who you say you are, that you did what you came to do, that your death on the cross gives me hope for eternal life. I realize that I have fallen short. I have sinned and I repent of that and I confess that. And I want you, Lord, to come and be Lord of my life so that I can truly embrace life to the full. And Lord, maybe there are some who have prayed that prayer in the past but have grown cynical over time and tonight's their night to be reminded that they have peace and joy and contentment because of what you did on the cross in spite of our earthly circumstances. And that's what enables them to truly celebrate Christmas. Lord, regardless of where we are in our faith walk, I pray that this Christmas would be more meaningful than ever because we are thinking about what you did on the cross while we celebrate your birth in a manger. And may that change everything for us. Lord, we love you. Thanks for loving us. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas, guys. I wish we could be celebrating in person tonight, um, but we pray that this is the most meaningful and amazing Christmas that you have. And in the meantime, before we get to see you again, we pray that you stay safe, stay healthy, so that when we come back together, we can celebrate a risen Savior who was born in a manger, who died on a cross, that gives us hope and joy and contentment. Merry Christmas. We hope to see you really soon.